With these structures now clarified, let's now consider the internal anatomy of the spinal cord. To do so, let's take a look at a cross-section from the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral divisions of the spinal cord. The first glaring aspect that you might notice from these cross-sections is that, regardless of the level, they all pretty much look the same, and indeed, it turns out that although they have small differences between the regions, they generally share the same anatomical and functional properties. This fact makes sense because as a processing unit, the spinal cord is very stereotypical and processes sensory and motor information somewhat in the same way between the arms, the legs, the torso, and so on. For that reason, we will cover the internal anatomy of the spinal cord by considering a general cross-section that will apply for all. One important difference that I want to point out right now before we get into the general cross-section is about the size of the cross-sections. As you can see, Relative to one another, the cervical and lumbar cross-sections are much bigger than the other two, and that is explained due to the cervical and lumbosacral enlargements that cause the cross-sections to be wider. Remember that the enlargements are the regions that supply the limbs, which are the regions that require the most sensory motor processing, thus making them anatomically bigger. Now, to orient ourselves during our next topics, I want to begin by discussing the main anatomical landmarks that the cross-section has, and to do so, it's important that we orient ourselves with the navigational terms. From our last discussion that we had on spinal nerves, you will remember that the orientation we are currently in is from ventral or anterior on this side, and it goes towards the dorsal or posterior side. Additionally, because of the bilateral structure of the spinal cord, the midline point divides the two lateral sides like this. This orientation is important to keep in mind because a lot of the terminology is based on that. Alright, now as a preemptive note, I want to warn you that while covering the internal anatomy of the spinal cord, the figures will get rather dense pretty quickly, so make sure to go slowly if these terms are new for you. With this being said, starting from the spinal nerve that carries both sensory and motor information of the somatic and autonomic nervous system, you will remember that the spinal cord splits in two structures, one called the dorsal root ganglion that contains the cell bodies of the sensory afferents, and the ventral root that contains the axons of somatic and autonomic efferent neurons leaving the spinal cord. Inside the spinal cord, you will notice that there are two different shades of color, and these represent gray and white matter. To understand the difference between the two, we need to recall the structure of a neuron, which you can see in the bottom right. So, gray matter, as shown by the beige color in the center of the spinal cord, corresponds to the cell bodies of the neurons. Hence, the H or butterfly-shaped structure in the middle is mostly all cell bodies. On the other hand, the white contour that you see is white matter and it is called that way because the myelin sheets of myelinated axons make it appear clearer in imaging studies. Recall from our discussion about neurons that myelin sheets are produced by two types of glial cells, namely Schwann cells that myelinate neurons in the peripheral nervous system and oligodendrocytes that myelinate neurons in the central nervous system. As a structure, myelin wraps around the axon and generates these zones called nodes of Ranvier that contribute greatly in increasing the velocity of propagation of the action potential. Two other anatomical landmarks that are important to mention are the posterior median sulcus and the anterior median fissure. Now, with this established, let's cover the divisions of the gray and white matter, starting with the gray matter. The upper dorsal portion of the gray matter is called the dorsal or posterior gray horn and it corresponds to the terminal zone for the somatic and visceral sensory neurons. Basically, neurons in this region receive the inputs coming from the periphery and then send it up to the brain or brainstem for further processing. The two shades of blue differentiate where the somatic information and visceral information generally go to. As we will see shortly with some more precise divisions of the gray matter, Somatic information contacts neurons in the more dorsal part, whereas the visceral inputs go to more ventral parts in the light blue region. The bottom ventral portion of the gray matter is called the ventral or anterior gray horn, and it contains the cell bodies of somatic motor neurons that activate our striated muscles. In between the dorsal and ventral horns, we can find the intermediate zone, and the two most important components that it contains are the cell bodies of preganglionic sympathetic and parasympathetic efferent neurons. Now, the sympathetic cell bodies are only found in segments T1 to L3, and for the parasympathetic system, they are found in segments S2 to S4. 
In terms of terminology, the sympathetic cell bodies produce an additional bump on the gray matter that is often called the lateral horn, but outside of T1 to L3, it is not found. As a quick shorthand, it is generally safe to reduce the dorsal part to sensory processing and the ventral part to motor processing. These dorsal, ventral, and intermediate zone divisions of the gray matter that I have just introduced can be further divided into 10 more specific sections that are called rex laminae. By the way, as a quick side note, the word rex comes from the last name of the neuroanatomist that came up with these divisions. Now, as you will see shortly, some of the rex divisions contain clusters of neuron cell bodies that share some given property, and as a collective, they are referred to as a nucleus. The terminology to refer to a group of neuron cell bodies as a nucleus is only done in the structures that are a part of the central nervous system. Remember that clusters of neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system were referred to as ganglions. A good example of that was the dorsal root ganglion, which is seen just outside of the spinal cord. Another important aspect about these nuclei to keep in mind is that how they group is not necessarily always in spherical lumps, but it can also be done in columns, and for that reason, some of the nuclei we will encounter are actually called columns, and that is because they span multiple segments in the shape of a column. Finally, I want to let you know that in this video, I will mostly offer an introductory overview for each division without going extensively in the details of each nuclei or lamina, because we will revisit these divisions in their respective contexts, and in these videos about either the somatosensory system or the motor system, it will feel much more relevant to discuss their specifics. Nonetheless, we can start with the Rex laminae that are contained in the dorsal horn, which are the first six. The six laminae are somewhat organized in horizontal layers, and as you might suspect, they will play some role in processing sensory information. Rex lamina 1 is the most dorsal lamina, and it contains the posterior marginal nucleus, which receives information about pain and temperature. The second lamina is also known as the substantia gelatinosa of Rolando, which is a nucleus that receives pain, temperature, and touch information. Lamina 3 and 4 can be grouped together as they share the nucleus proprius. This nucleus receives information about pain, temperature, and touch. Lamina 5 and 6 can also be grouped together as they are less precise in their function, but together they allow for processing of touch, proprioception, and pain from visceral organs. You can see more clearly now why the dorsal horn is divided in two different shades of blue. Moving on to lamina 7, it is the only lamina corresponding to the intermediate zone. This lamina has three particular nuclei, namely the interomedial lateral nucleus and interomedial medial nucleus that contain the cell bodies of preganglionic sympathetic and parasympathetic efferents. Remember that the sympathetic efferents are from segments T1 to L3 and parasympathetic from S2 to S4. The third nucleus is called Clark's column and it deals with processing of proprioception. This column is only present from C7 to L3. The next two laminae, lamina 8 and 9, are part of the ventral gray horn and process motor information. Lamina 8 contains motor interneurons that mediate reflex pathways, and lamina 9 contains somatic motor neurons that activates triadid muscles. As you can see, there are three general nuclei in lamina 9. The most medial one is responsible for the activation of axial muscles, the central one for proximal limbs, and the most lateral one is responsible for distal muscles. Remember that the regions of the spinal cord that are responsible for our distal limbs are located in the cervical and lumbosacral enlargements, thus the lateral nuclei are only present at these enlargements. Additionally, for all these nuclei, their ventral regions activate extensor muscles and their dorsal region activate their flexor muscles. Again, we will cover all these concepts in much more detail when we will discuss motor systems. Finally, we have the last lamina, lamina 10, that is also known as the gray commissure, and basically the central region is a path that connects the two sides of the spinal cord. Now, it's possible that in your notes or textbooks or whatever resource you use, that you find these sections to be divided differently or described in a different manner in terms of their function, and that is totally normal because although we have a good idea of how the spinal cord operates, there is still a lot to be learned, which makes different sources of information be slightly variable. Accordingly, don't worry if what's written on here doesn't match entirely what you learned, 
every rendition of the Rex Laminate that I've used to sort of gather and integrate for this video are different to some extent. With this being said, we can move on to the white matter. Recall that white matter corresponds to the axons of the cell bodies of neurons that are in the gray matter. Many axons together can go either up to the brain or brainstem and form what are called ascending tracks, or they can be coming from the brain or brainstem by descending tracks. Essentially, the white matter of the spinal cord acts as an elevator to get information up and down. Much like the gray matter, the white matter is divided into different sections that have their respective functions and processing. Because they are axons and not cell bodies or dendrites, broad white matter sections are referred to as columns, and as you will see later, columns are composed out of tracks. Generally speaking, there are three zones of white matter. The dorsal white column, the lateral white column, and the ventral white columns that each contain multiple tracks. Similar to the Rex laminae, I will offer an overview of these white matter tracks, but note that the more specific details will be discussed in the respective videos. The way we will go about covering them will be to first look at ascending tracks, and then we will go about the descending tracks. Starting with the dorsal column, it only contains ascending tracks, and sometimes just the dorsal column on its own can be considered as an ascending track. Nonetheless, it is also often divided into the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus, which altogether carry touch and proprioception information from the body. The fasciculus gracilis is responsible for supplying the lower extremities, so it collects sensory information from T6 and below. For the segments T5 and above, that sensory information is conveyed by the fasciculus cuneatus, which is responsible for upper extremities. You will notice that the fasciculus cuneatus is more lateral than the fasciculus gracilis, and that makes sense because the information about the upper regions is added onto the existing tract for lower limbs. Now, in the lateral column, there are four different ascending tracts, the dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tracts, the lateral spinothalamic tract, and the spinoolivary tract. In terms of nomenclature, the tracts that have names like this all follow the same rule of the first part being the starting point and the last name being the end point. So, for example, the spinocerebellar tract starts with spino, so the tract begins at the spinal cord and ends in the cerebellum, which is represented by the cerebellar. Similarly, the spinothalamic tract begins in the spinal cord and ends in the thalamus. With respect to their functions, the dorsal division of the spinocerebellar tract is responsible for proprioception for segments C8 to L2 and the ventral part for proprioception for segments L3 to the coccyx. The lateral spinothalamic tract carries mainly pain and temperature information to the thalamus and lastly, the spinoolivary tract goes from the spinal cord to the inferior olive and is responsible for carrying proprioceptive information. In the ventral column, there is one ascending tract, and it is the ventral or anterior division of the spinothalamic tract. This division carries sensory information about crude touch and pressure. Now, when it comes to the descending tracts, they can be broadly separated into pyramidal and extrapyramidal tracts. The difference in name comes from a structure in the brainstem called the pyramids, which convey the pyramidal tracts, whereas the extrapyramidal tracts take other routes to reach the spinal cord. In the lateral white column, there are three descending pathways, the lateral corticospinal tract, the rubrospinal tract, and the medullary division of the reticulospinal tract. The lateral corticospinal tract is the major tract that descends from the motor regions in the brain to coordinate voluntary fine movements of distal muscles that are associated with our limbs. The rubrospinal tract starts at the red nucleus and descends in the spinal cord to facilitate and modulate the activation of voluntary movements. It mostly does so by activating flexor muscles. The reticulospinal tract has an important role in influencing motor control, posture, and locomotion. It has two divisions, and the one in the lateral column is called the medullary division, which, as you might suspect, arises from the medulla. In the ventral column, there are four descending tracts. The first is the pontine division of the reticulospinal tract that comes from the pons and participates as well in the modulation of movement. Secondly, there is the anterior corticospinal tract that helps coordinating the movements of axial muscles. In third, there is the tectospinal tract that activates muscles of the head and neck to coordinate them with movements of the eyes. Finally, there is the vestibulospinal tract that activates extensor muscles from the signals of the vestibular system 
to control balance and posture. The last two white matter pathways that are important to point out are the anterior white commissure, which, just like the gray commissure, allows to connect the two halves of the spinal cord together, and that allows for information to cross over. The second pathway is the Lee Sowers tract, which is known as the dorsal lateral fasciculus. Simply put, before the sensory afferents for pain and temperature enter the spinal cord through the spinal nerve, the Lee Sowers tract allows for these afferents to ascend or descend one to two vertebral segments before they enter the spinal cord. For example, information that is picked up by the spinal nerve T6 could enter in segments T4 or T8. When we consider all the respective lamina and columns of the white and gray matter, we get a spinal cord that looks something like this. Keep in mind again that this picture is generalized of the actual functional segmentation of the spinal cord, but it nonetheless provides us with a good overview of what's going on there. A final detail that I want to point out is that if we consider back the cross sections from each segment we had in the beginning, you will notice that starting at the sacral segment, as you go up towards the cervical segments, the proportion of white matter increases and the gray matter decreases. Inversely, as you go down, the quantity of white matter decreases and gray matter increases. The simple reasoning for why this occurs can be explained from the fact that as you go up through the spinal cord, the ascending tracts accumulate, and as you are up in the higher levels, the descending tracts have yet to reach their targets, hence causing the gray to white matter ratios to be like this. Inversely, in the more caudal levels of the spinal cord, the ascending tracts have yet to form and the descending tracts have reached most of their targets. With the white matter tracts now covered, we have gone through all the main points that there are to discuss with respect to the spinal cord. The topics we have covered are the external anatomy of the vertebral column, the spinal nerve segments and the associated dermatome map, the anatomy of somatic nerves, the anatomy of sympathetic nerves, and then we went into the internal anatomy of the spinal cord by discussing the general landmarks, the rex laminae of gray matter, and the white matter tracks. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in our next discussion.